Yeah, we'll go to our next lecture, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Kenneth Hartigan-Go. Uh, Kenneth is actually a non-resident research fellow of the Ateneo Policy Center of the School of Government and the program director for leadership and innovation of the Ateneo School of Government. He was an adjunct faculty at the AIM, the Asian Institute of Management, serving as school head of the Stephen Zuwili School of Development Management. He's an honorary visiting associate professor of the Saw so Sui Hock uh, School of Public Health, National University of Singapore. He was Philippine Department of Health Undersecretary in 2015 to 16, Director General of Food and Drug Administration, October uh, 2012 to 2014, and Deputy Director of the Bureau of Food and Drugs as well. He was the founding Executive Director of the Zuwili Foundation and faculty of the UP College of Medicine, uh, Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health, and AIM. And I'm also very proud to say that he is the Philippine College of Physicians past president and a foundation vice president. Kenneth? Thank you, Lexi. Pleasant good morning to everybody, special guests. Um, and also, thank you, Choli, Dr. Choli, you for inviting me. You don't turn Dr. Choli down when he invites you, you have to accept. But um, thank you, Professor Nilo, for giving this, uh, your talk because it provides a little bit of introduction to the next talk. I have two parts to this talk. The first part is to give you some optimism, some directions and a framework for you to craft health studies, research and innovation. The second part, which is the last part of it, is to give you a reality check. Where are the landmines where we need to resolve to make this a better place for us. So is innovation a good thing? One of the things that enter into your mind, it's not necessarily a good thing because sometimes the innovation can be used for bad purposes, weaponization of technology and knowledge. Secondly, you have to ask yourself, is innovation a public good or a commodity of trade? We'll discuss it a little bit later on. But you have to ask yourself, why are you innovating? because there is a need. There's an unmet need. Secondly, it's a sign of the times that uh, call for you to step up. Or are you doing it only for your institution or for your personal ego? There are many motivations why people enter into doing health research, discovery, and invention. Question is, can anybody, can just anybody innovate? And we will discuss that later on. The innovation that we do has to have a value. It cannot just be purely for abstract purposes. And I'll do a reality check, as I said later on. Albert Einstein said, you cannot solve the problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. Why did he say this? The problems that we face nowadays are caused by people, maybe out of good intention has introduced solution, but those solutions have caused more problems. To it, if you look at the Philippine healthcare, and I'm giving you for the students an important um, understanding, if you want to play a role, where are the roles you want to, where the sector you want to enter? Health is one of them, and we have complex ideologies about health. Sec and I will explain that later. Health sector is one of the most heavily regulated sector industry in the country. The, the, the human resource will have to be licensed, Products that we use have to be licensed, equipments, facilities, clinical trial will have to be uh, checked and tested before they are allowed with ethical guidelines and for, for example. So. so despite all this heavy regulation created out of a good intention, are we fulfilling our mission to, to, to bloom this kind of research? Uh, many moving parts, wide geographical, but, but sadly there is a two standards for healthcare. There is one for the rich and one for the poor. Um, two things that you have to remember if you are trying to introduce health innovation. Am I solving a fundamental problem in healthcare? Fragmentation. The devolution of the local government code in 1991 was made out of a good intention, but perhaps healthcare wasn't ready to implement it. It's under some political supervision. Some local government are doing well. Many are failing in terms of delivery. 
So if you're going to do something, think about how it's going to impact our fragmentation and solve this problem. The second problem is inequity. I work under the late Secretary Alberto Romualdez, and he always drummed, to, uh, dr drummed in this uh, principle. The poor is actually subsidizing the rich for their health care. And we could go into a long, long debate and discussion about it, but this is the conclusion we arrive at, the heavy inequities. Kenneth Arrow, a Nobel Prize winner, way back in 1963, wrote a seminal article published. It's available in the public domain. If you search from it in uh, Google, you might be able to find this article published in American Economic Review, Healthcare, Uncertainty of Health and Welfare. Basically, his thesis was to ask this question, is healthcare a commodity of trade or is it a public good? You could translate this into health innovation as well. The innovations that you create, is it meant to, for trade, where only a few will be able to benefit and access, or is it meant for public good? Now, we are not saying that health innovations should be given for free. Surely, there's a cost for intellectual property, and there's a value there, because people respond to some economic value for the hard work that you put, and you should be rewarded for that. And that's why there are many laws that protect the outputs, the products, and the innovations that you put forth. But you need to temper that with some level of social responsibility. If people are not able to access it, it's only meant for a few, are, is innovation therefore a good thing? So Larry Ellison also said that when you innovate, you've got to be prepared for people calling you nuts. So Dr. Choliu is an example of a crazy person. And all those people around him who are working for him, you have some degree of craziness in a good sense. Why? You need to be crazy. You need to be willing to push the boundary to test. Baka pwede to. Let's try this. But for ordinary people, they will never understand. They will say, this guy is nuts. But you be prepared. You be prepared for people to call you that. Now, again, if you want to enter the health sector and do some work on health innovation, it is not just in technology. It is in social determinants of health. So if you look at this slide, it is very complex. There are many areas that you can enter. Policy, technology, financing, um, uh, solving problems of malnutrition, solving problems of access to uh, going to a health center, and the like. No? There are biologic and, 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 uh, and, and other things that you could develop for, for that purpose. So, to simplify this, I'm going to give you this. The work that you do can be bucketed into six different components. You can't solve the complex problem of healthcare by trying to solve everything. So you need to be more focused. You could work in the area of policy, governance, and regulation, or you might want to work in how do I improve the work of healthcare professionals and worker both in facilities, both in the field, to make their job easier. Facilities and services is another way. Can I apply technology? How do I develop more medicine? And there are plenty of examples mentioned earlier. No? There's information system that you could data mine. Uh, again, it was mentioned much earlier that, that uh, artificial intelligence can now gather the data and come up with some level of conclusion. Financing is another part. So, because healthcare is so complex, the innovations that you put in has to answer maybe one or two of these complex systems together. This slide was taken from when I brought some students from AIM to Marawi, and this was in Iligan when we went down and observed how evacuation centers are being managed. And this, were the, this was a scene that we saw after more than five months of their being there, these internally displaced people. So we brought this to classrooms and say, can you innovate an ideal evacuation site? So the health design thinking that we did in classroom was to stimulate masteral students who come from all walks of life. They're not in healthcare. But we said, can you bring transdisciplinary group of people like engineer, construction, economies, people who are involved in invention to create what to you is a dream evacuation center that will sustain 
in, internally displaced people or refugees for a period of one week to one month. Therefore, lessening the burden that they give to local government. So they came up with also, some of them have solar panels, plumbing. So they have to think through. They have to take in themselves as like an evacuation person and what are my needs? And they start planning the setup of an evacuation center. Henry Ford. You know Henry Ford <coughs> uh, created the car, right? He invented the car. But during his time, if he were to ask the society, how do we improve transportation? The typical answer is, well, we need faster horses. If everybody thought the same way, unlike him, he would not have invented the car. Okay? This is also an example of something heartwarming. Um, COVID. Wait, I have a slide on COVID. Oh, okay. COVID was an important uh, milestone for us, eh? where there were, um, the, what do you call it, isolation wards that COVID patients had to be placed there. And in this hospital called Iloilo Provincial Hospital, which is a level, one ho level two hospital, they had to minimize contact between healthcare worker working in this isolation ward and the people who are outside supporting them. Food, medicine, documents, etc. So Assumption students in Iloilo decided to donate their intellectual uh, innovation. They created a pulley system. And this pulley system ran all the way up to the second floor over here with a box, a metal box, that brought in medicine up and down, then minimizing the use of PPE. Okay? So simple innovation, but it has a lot of, uh, it, has a lot, it does a lot of good, right? You minimize uh, contact and the like. So, one of the mistakes that we're doing in terms of intervention in healthcare improvement is looking at the inputs, and the inputs are on the left side. Previously, I showed you a slide with the six building blocks. Now, I want you to concentrate on the right side. This right side tells us the goals of why we're creating better inputs, because we want to have improved health in patients and in population. We want to have responsiveness of healthcare. We want to have social inclusiveness and financial risk protection. And lastly, improve efficiency. If you were to do any health innovations technology-wise, you must anchor the belief that what you're doing will ultimately become better outcomes. You're anchoring what you do with something bigger than yourself. And just don't be happy with doing improvements on the left side. So now I introduce a basic concept of health, of design thinking. We borrow this from business tool, but we translate it to health. It begins first with empathy. What is empathy? You understand the needs of your clients, your customer, the patients, the community, their families. And once you empathize them, you start defining what is their problem. If you cannot define that problem in two sentences and you go into a litany, you have not specified what are you trying to solve. Only by doing that can you go into ideation or generating ideas, which now comes back into prototyping, creating a model, and then testing it. One of the problems with doctors doing this is that medical doctors want to be perfect. That's in our nature. It is the way we're brought up in our training. Right? But because of that, we are afraid to test, go into territory that we are uncomfortable with because we will be criticized. And we don't want to be criticized. We don't want to be labeled as failures. But it is precisely the health design thinking is challenging you to go into a journey. By failing early, by knowing your limits, by going back to your patients and testing it, will it create a better focus um, uh, uh, focus-centric uh, 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 solution that is customized for the needs of your constituents. Okay? So please remember this, it is a cycle. It looks like an infinity cycle, but that's the process and journey of innovation. You will fail, and you will fail again and again. You must be ready to, don't be onion skin, you must be ready to accept criticism, 
so that you can improve. Those that give criticism may be constructive. Some of them can be destructive, but it doesn't matter. As long as you know that you're, you are accomplishing this journey. Okay, next stop. Next slide, please. Technology, no? Problem. This morning, I came in and they asked for my slides, so I gave them this. And they said, um, there was a stop for a while, no? They said, sir, we don't have this anymore. So I pulled out my USB. But I've reminded that uh, we grew up with this, right? And for the younger generation, you probably have not seen this anymore. It's a, it's a disk drive. <laughs> so when we were doing our PhD thesis, ang haba-haba, we have to have at least 20 of these for the different chapters and annexes because it can only store so much. But anyway, uh, I have so many of these, I don't know what to do with it anymore. Elon Musk. He said, failure is, not, is an option. If things are not failing, then you're not pushing the boundaries of innovation far enough. Okay? So he's now in venturing into space travel. Problem is, healthcare professionals, especially doctors, have a lot of ego. This ego is going to pull us back because we're afraid to be criticized, we're afraid to fail, we're afraid to take risks. And this adds to a level of frustration. So what is the message here? In doing innovation, siyempre kailangan may kunting pride, may kunting yabang. But you also have to learn the balance of humility. Because if you have ego, you bring it into the laboratory, you will never succeed. Jack Ma said, if you never try it, how will you know if there's any chance for success? I'm going to give you now the bad story. Reality check. Because you deserve to know this. So Professor Nilo mentioned that research is not easy. You have to be prepared, frustrated, you will fail, you will uh, you need to collaborate. And it's not easy to do all that. So there are four take-home messages I want to share with you. The first one is bureaucracy, once that was useful, may be counterproductive for innovation. I, we did a survey a couple of years back with international groups and a few academic uh, researchers, and their uniform answer was, the school is not making this helpful for us to conduct good research. What do they mean by that? They said, it takes nine to 10 signatures to buy a spare part to a machine that is broken. And because of that, it will take about six months before they would even have the part. And when it comes, mali pa. So they will undergo bidding, procurement, canvassing. So if you are a researcher, the glory of a researcher being up on the pedestal, that's an illusion. Because that researcher will have to work with a team of people, supporting him administratively on the, on the back end. So... But why was bureaucracy created? And I said, it is not a bad thing because it was created for a context of the time. One of the reasons they cited was we don't trust the academic researchers. They are using the money irresponsibly, so we need to have check and balance. If I put my signature there, kailangan matingnan muna ng isang technical person, before, review muna before I sign. So you go to each of the steps of this academic institution, and not all of them naman, the majority of them have to go back and create a support. So what is the lesson here? You need to create a support system that will improve the expediency of research. Because research is competitive. If researchers are finding a hard time doing this, what do you think, where do you think they will go? They will not do research anymore. They will do something more financially lucrative. And we will lose the talents that we invested. Secondly, they will go abroad because they are more welcome elsewhere. So that environment has to be done. Secondly, regulatory barriers stifle innovations and, and translation to access. I was a director general for Food and Drug Administration. We tried to clean up some of the process. I guess we could have done a little bit more in retrospect, we said many of the problems of regulators is that they are not 
catching up with the technology of science. They don't read, they don't attend conventions and seminars, they don't interact with industry, and industry is a driver for innovation. Sometimes I think regulators have to get out of the way to let this thousand flower bloom. Unfortunately, there is need for regulations to be there. Why? Because regulations is a national, uh, is a surrogate for national interest. You have to protect people, consumer, because not all researchers are, shall we say, legit. So th there are theirs who are making all sorts of claims and the like. But at the end of the day, the regulators have to do something to protect people and protect uh, the industry as well from, from bad competition and the like. But sometimes regulatory barriers are there. What are the examples when we did that research? They said, uh, we're just too happy coming up with a prototype and an idea and it never translates out into some useful application and we cannot hurdle the regulatory compliance because there are so many rigid, rigid rules and therefore we can never commercialize. And many researchers are not in fact thinking of commercializing it. They're just too happy publishing a paper showing a proof of concept. But that's not enough. As was mentioned earlier, you need an entire value chain from beginning to end. Kailangan may translation to the benefit of people. The, the other thing is, sometimes when you go to a regulator, they'll say, Ay, this is so new that we don't have a standard and therefore let's not regulate it. And, and you're left doing nothing because you cannot market, you cannot, because nobody wants to regulate you. But, but again, even in a low-middle-income low, low country, the regulators can partner with other regulators to create a center for innovations and learn what, how can, what can we do to pilot or sandbox this model that will benefit Filipino people. Government officials, with some exceptions, by and large, they are afraid to take risks by coming up with innovative policy. Because if they do and something bad happens, they are called to Senate. Do you know that even clinical trialists can be given a criminal charge and be brought to court? That's very unfortunate. So this part of the game, government, this is academe, this is government, has to do something to protect researchers because we're going to lose talents. This third part is going to be very controversial. Innovations is not for everybody. Well, we encourage everybody to think innovation, use and apply it and understand it. At the end of the day, you cannot have everybody doing innovations. They are not built for, it might sound elitist and exclusive. The reality is not everybody can do it. I, and therefore, here's the problem. There are good natured angel investor who wants to give money to invest in innovation, but they have to be careful. They have to practice what I call innovators triage, who are most likely to succeed because the theory of change is sound, and they are a winning team, they work together, they can produce something, and what's their track record? And that's, that's a sensible way to, to invest. Now, the problem with that kind of thinking is a system archetype that you will only, if your organization to help this institution grow is to only look for people who will be successful, how do you know that you disenfranchise a group that could have been successful because, but they were not given the chance. The system archetype is called giving, investing on those who will be succeeding with a success factor. But then you marginalize people who can, be, can also be successful but then were never given the chance. But my message here, the lesson I learned here is it's, it's a privilege only given to a few. It's not for everybody. But once you have it, it's not about profit alone. It's also about social innovation in translating this to the needs of the poor. Okay? The last part I have here over here is we have serious problem in human resource production and employment. This is not just only about innovation and research. This is also about basic education. Our fundamentals are not very good. 
And when they get into college, science is not really a strong point yet. The problem I have here is that while we're trying to solve the problem of the now, the complex health problem of the now, we're not talking about what will happen 10 years from now and are we preparing the health professionals now to respond to 10 years and 25 years down the line. Dr. Cholio knows this because we're part of this technical working group on health sector skills council we want to develop. But, but the end point here is, who's going to talk about the future? And the Economist article in 2023 published in January mentioned the top four changes that is going to happen in Asia. Uh, they mentioned AI. Uh, and telemedicine. They mentioned uh, robotics, which I think we are already getting involved, genomics, personalized medicine, and lastly is on uh, 3D printing. And if we are not preparing our healthcare sector, not just the doctors, but all the other uh, important components of the health service, we will not be prepared to deal with it. Um, so the lesson here is there has to be radical change uh, in the way education needs to, to change no? uh, in order to address that problem. So I guess, I guess these are my uh, key message I want to say. No? Okay. At the end of the day, you need to be led by some visionary leaders. You have a team of people. You're working, you're putting your, all your energies and resources to do something good. At the end of the day, the question that you ask yourself is everybody wants change. But when you ask who wants to change themselves with all the things that I mentioned earlier here, nobody wants to start. And if you ask anybody who is willing to lead them, everybody runs away. So this part of the equation is very important. If we don't have these crazy people trying to motivate us to change the world, we will never know we will never succeed, okay? So I, I hope I've imparted some reality check on where are the landmines that needs to be changed in order to promote better innovation. But if you want to go into innovation, you have to think about what sector of healthcare I want to go in so that you don't dilute and waste your energy, okay? Thank you very much. I, I hope uh, the, uh, you, got, you got something out of this, no? All right, thank you. Thank you, Ken. I, I'd like to ask you to come forward. We're, we're not going to have our last speaker. Instead, we're going to have an open forum. May I ask the three speakers, Trolley, Professor Nilo, and Ken, right here, if you have questions from the floor, online, uh, would you like to take a seat? Uh, yeah. Uh, Secretary, would you like to join for those? At Tony, want to come in? Baka may gusto magtanong tungkol sa... Uh, in uh, the PhilCat convention, there's a eagerly awaited uh, the DOH secretary hour. <laughs> in that forum, sec, all over the country, they ask uh, queries that are on, on, in the field, meaning say what they see as gut issues. So. Okay. Are there so, any... Oh, yeah. This is a good time for the audience to now ask. This is now uh, audience interaction, participation, questions from the floor. Uh, we'll go to you. Hi, it's already good afternoon. So thank you for all the lectures. Um, I'd like to take off from what Dr. Kenneth Hartingo said, that we have to start it now. In your fourth message where you have to develop human resources, and you're talking about the now. So I'm in the academe, so I'd like to, to ask, um, like, what do you think is the most important thing that we should do as educators now so that we can look into the future 10 years from now and create such innovations that is going to be helpful for the community in the future? Thank um, you. I, I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for your most difficult question. It, it's, um, um, innovation is everybody's business and so is uh, healthcare. It's everybody. So I guess, I guess they has, you have to bring the entire health sector together. You have to bring regulators like the different boards of health sciences in the PRC because they're, they're, they're the problem. Eh? They dictate on what a doctor, nurse, dentist should know 
so that they are in a way regulated but it's not a, it's not a, no, it's it's not attuned to the times of the future it's only it's here now no? but then you also have to deal with advanced industry like health facilities the administrators who's who are now thinking of bringing new technology into the country and you have to retrain more people i i I guess what we need to do is a it's a whole of nation approach. Yeah, uh, uh, Ken is part of a group that's organizing to actually think about what we need in the future in health manpower, research, technology, and I think that this is a good conversation because we don't actually know the answers. What do we need? Do we need uh, biostatisticians? Do we need biotech uh, engineers, PhDs? Do we need uh, people who are doing the robotics? Do we need people in the 3D, with AI, etc.? So that conversation has to start with us and connect it with the uh, updated NURA, the National Unified Heat. I think it should connect. Kaya lang, I can share some. I didn't want to share this horror story, but I will. During the pandemic, we attempted to do a new ventilator using an MIT prototype with the foundations of uh, the Unilab and Gokong Wei. And we finally made 10 models uh, with the help of uh, my colleagues there. The problem was, nung ipapa test namin, nobody knew the standard to test. So the irony is, ako pa yung tinawa, kami yung part ng team, but I was the one. Uh, advising the, the the technical consultant on what standards uh, he should apply. So, yun ang problema, and this is also happening in our R2D2 sec. But may pinasok kami parang testing kit, like the one you saw, the stethoscope. Hinaharang kasi hindi pa daw proven. Eh, ang point namin, kaya nga namin ginagawa yung study para ma-prove nga. So, there was even a device that was actually used for covid and I said, wouldn't that be enough? Because TB naman to, eh. Ano sila, pareho sila. Eh, banda huli, they gave up. Said, Sige, bahala na kayo. So, parang the regulatory, ano, is not ahead yung, yung point mo, hindi nagbabasa about the advances. And it, it is also true across uh, the bureaucracy. A hospital will judge you on the paper-based checklist, and they were already into computers and e-records. This is happening in, in many of the... Even in PCP, uh, I was past president, uh, so I can say this. When there was an innovative program in UP, and we used our old standards for accreditation, hindi po masa si UP, kasi it was based on an old accreditation message that did not actually encourage innovation and uh, trying to change. So we have to talk, kasi nga, tama yun, invento tayo ng invento, we have good ideas. Pagdating, hindi man lang natin ma mapasok yung technology because hindi tayo naiintindihan ng regulators. So, I think that is one of the messages. We have to understand and if we do not understand o gaya yung ginawa ni Nilo, they develop the devices to test. So, do, yun yung isang project ng IBET na walang gustong mag-test eh. Ganun. Ganun nangyari sa ventilator. There was only one company that tested but didn't have the standards. Thank you. So, pareha kay Doc Kenneth at saka kay Doc Charles. <laughs> okay, so, sa akin naman ito eh. Para bang, sorry ha, medyo uh, emotional ako dito kasi sa, sa daming umaasa. Agapay went to ano, uh, National Science and Technology Week in Davao. And President Duterte were there and ang dami doong mga pilay, gusto ng, oh, kailangan ko yan sa bahay, kailangan ko yan lahat, di ba? But sadly, balik naman tayo doon sa sinamin ni Doc Charles sa kanya, no? Na for this kind of, let's say, advanced technology, is not registrable in FDA. Kasi wala silang masundan pa, di ba? So, what we are planning actually, Secretary, we want to go into our neighboring countries, file the 
yung patent or whatever yung uh, clinical trials para ma-approve yung protocol, then conduct it there, dalhin uli dito. Ganun lang talagang naisip namin, Secretary. Kasi there is nothing we can contact. Of course, there are many people who volunteer. Oh, we can do that. We can do that. But seeing, looking their track record, it's not really good. So, Yusik Guevara and Secretary Boy, they said that if we don't have it, then we have a bilateral agreement with Taiwan, the most close, then why not? So, it's designed by the Filipinos, manufactured abroad, then bring it back. But I don't think I will agree with that as well. Ang ano ko lang na for the initial thing that we can do, kay kay sa mag ano ka lang magtinginan lang kayo na wala magawa. Why not do it, de ba? So subukan natin yung pathway na yan, de ba? Kasi we can just contain na antay tayo hanggang kailan sila maano matuto. Because one thing we have discovered as well. There is what we think, I, I don't know if you agree with this, na going through this hard way talaga, parang there is what we, we found out that there is a Philippine-made uh, stigma. Parang kung gawa ng Pinoy, parang ah, mas maganda pang China kahit ano, kaysa dito sa gagawa natin, kababayan. Because I don't know. Parang the technology that you are doing, parang hindi fit ngayon sa culture nato. So that's what we have this current. That's our opinion. Na parang ang hirap talaga. So we need support. We need all these people, but we cannot just simply wait and wait. So we have to look really the the different ways. Because the the money that supported our is coming from the people, from the government, through the DOST. So, we just not need to wait until sabihin, oh, ano na kayo, di ba? So, that's one thing. I don't know what I can say about that secretary. Put crazy people. So, sir, there is a question from an online participant. So, it's from Dr. Rafael Rodolfo. The question is, how can medical schools ensure that their students are well prepared to work with artificial intelligence in the future practice, particularly given the rapid pace of technological change in the healthcare system? Does, does that involve um, innovating also in, in, in our medical curriculum? Yeah. Okay. I just visited the university in Australia and they have an integrated uh, research and development application and commercialization DNA. You need to be working together with other fields just like many projects here. Medical doctor, mechanical engineer, data scientist. That's the new field that we need to look into. So. To, see, to be serious about the response to the first question, we need to converse with the FDA. We need to be working with them rather than uh, uh, having this feeling of uh, uh, an antagonist. So we have to understand that we need people to be exposed to the new field of science and technology. And I think that's one thing we can do. No? I think one of the purposes of the breakout sessions is narinig nyo na kami, maybe it's time na kayo ngayon na mag-suggest. Some of the brightest suggestions actually come from those who are not the most parang expert in the field. Some of the technologies have come out of left field because they, we think that it has been invented and somebody says, why don't you do this? So yun yung purpose ng mga bata dito. That's one. But I also said there's another rule, yung ethical. Nako, pinagdaanan namin ni Nilo yan. Kasi nga, you have to test it in humans. No? But nobody knows because we're into new technologies or even the ventilator. Walang standard. So hindi ma-apply ng ethical committees. Kaya hindi makalusot-lukos. Hindi maka-progress yung mga IBET projects and some of ours. Because uh, to be honest, and I've been in this for decades, 
it's because that hindi rin nag-modernize at upgrade yung mga ethics committees to actually accept the fact that they need to innovate their own standards. If they use their own standards, walang magpo-progress na innovation. Ewang probably also knows that. Nahihirapan kami because pag tinanong nila, na-prove na ba yan? Again, back to that question. Kaya nga namin ginagawa is to prove it. To prove it works. It has passed the proof of concept. And this one is under the OST in the FREB. Just to be honest, LaSalle has had a suspended ethics committee for almost half a year. So we actually send our protocols to Asian Hospital in Batangas. Because nung nag-lockdown, naubusan ng tao yung sekretariat ng mga nag-accredit nag and then puro online. So that has hampered the, 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 the and we found a way. We, you always have to find a way. So yun lang. Sorry, ah, nag share ng mga. <laughs> so, I, I, just in the interest of time, sir, uh, thank you very much to all our panelists. Uh, again, uh, if if some of our online participants, if if some of our online participants would like to ask questions, probably that would be sometime in the afternoon during the breakout sessions. Likewise, with our on-site participants. So, now we will proceed with the formal uh, MOA signing. I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Gina Nazareth. Sir, lahat, lahat po kayo ano. Promote lang the forum. Kami lang.